Hello everyone, welcome to the Jenkins Infrastructure Weekly Team Meeting. Today we are four on the table. Stéphane Merle, Hervé Lemeur, Mark White, and myself, Damien Duportal. Not sure why, okay, color changes for Hervé. Uh, let's get started with the weekly release. So, <coughs> Stéphane, what's the status since you just checked it? Um, <laughs> the first packaging built uh, uh, failed, um, but that's uh, uh, something not very uh, uh, definitive. I, I just uh, launch a replay and that should go smoothly. And the the change log has not been merged yet. Uh, there are some minor updates needed that I'll make. Uh, Kevin's out ill today, so I'll make those changes and merge them after this meeting. Okay. Thank you for the positives. Thanks. I forgot that. Um, Docker image to be built, and incoming change log, and last checklist item later today right yeah and i in order to keep my focus i'm going to stay in this meeting focused and we'll actually do the writing after the meeting perfect uh do you have other announcements one two three okay so let's get started with the next weekly that should be two 0.402 next week. Mm -hmm. So the 25 of April, if I'm okay. Yes, 25. Uh, the, the next LTS 387.3, yes, or four, I don't remember. Yes, scheduled for May 3, releasing May 3, release candidate uh, 19 April tomorrow. Uh, backporting has started. Chris Stern is the release lead. Backporting started and Chris Stern is release lead. Cool. Thanks. And Doc's team will write the change log and upgrade guide. That no need to note that, Damien. It, okay. Uh, it's um i haven't checked the security advisory but i don't recall having one we had one no last published week. no published plan for no published plan dis declared yet so none perfect next major event is the silicon is that correct Since right. DevOps may, is may eight and nine <clears throat> vancouver is that correct that's correct Okay, other announcement, major issue. Okay, so let's have a quick look on the task that we were able to finish during the, uh, the past milestone. Uh, we had a plugin in update on CI Jenkins IO to help the core developers around. So that's an update on the code coverage plugin. So done. Thanks, Hervé, for managing the Jenkins release. Uh, Twitter accounts suspension notice. So if I understand yeah. correctly, you had to downgrade the plan. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, we were on the, their previous uh, plan. And the uh, account was still active, but uh, it would have been cut uh, in uh, 40 days if we didn't uh, change the account type. I searched a little bit before finding how to do that because it wasn't obvious at all. Another great execution from Twitter. Change to avoid suspension. OK. Um... And we are within their usage in terms of publication numbers. Yeah, it's it's around uh, it's one thousand and five hundred tweets per month uh, allowed with this plan. So we are we're good. 
cool. Unless Thanks. we have a lot of developers publishing <laughs> a lot of plugins. That will be a first world problem then. Cool. Thanks. So no need to remove the RSS to Twitter publication okay. and we can continue. Nice job. Enable renovate for Jenkins infra stories. Okay, that was done a long time ago. Is that correct? But it's just it had to be closed. No, it's uh, I mm, I misread the uh, given uh, issue at first. I thought it was for plugin site, but it was an uh, NC skiff because I modified my message. But yeah, the story account, the story repository wasn't in C selected repository of renovate. So I have added, I added it. Cool. Thanks for helping. Uh, thanks, uh, Mark and Hervé, for the move Outstruck iBeams into Jenkins IO repository. I assume we done nothing. It's a uh, snake. I don't know how to pronounce his username, but he done uh, he done the work. Okay. Nothing else to do on this one. Um, we were able to ensure that Apache logs were collected by Datadog on our machines. That was required to measure the amount of data served by CI Jenkins IO, at least. Uh, that means now the update center update log are now streaming inside uh, Datadog if you want to extract some information about the data that is served by update center as well. So the next step is learning on Datadog how to do a dashboard that will measure the amount of data served by Apache. But it's working. Uh, I won't go on details. Uh, there were a lot of tiny hidden changes behind this one. And of course, I broke things that I fixed during the weekend. <laughs> Uh, jobs with tasks using Azure Upload are failing. That issue was opened by Alex. Thanks for mentioning that. That related to a uh, team and I trying the Azure Artifact Manager. There is an issue a bit later about that topic. So that's why I closed the issue telling that we have to follow back. So let's treat that one as a duplicate. But the takeaway is that some random jobs were failing for the archive artifact steps. So let's say half of the jobs worked as expected and half of the other failed with a TCP uncheck error inside the build logs. We disabled immediately. Team has started helping us on that specific area. So it only happened during a time window of 24 hours. That might happen again, but that time we will have to communicate. I took I sent an email and I realized that my email was blacklisted by Google Groups, even if I'm an admin of the mailing list. <laughs> Who knows? So next time I promise I will check that the email is received. <laughs> Self-improvement. Anyway, next issue, Update Center doesn't build because agent one is offline. Um, let's say we had the SSH key to rotate it and it was, uh, yeah, it was sometime we should have done that. The credential name on Trusted, just for the, the joke, the credential name was literally Cucumber Keys, please rotate. <laughs> so um, I cleaned up the puppets and I removed any mention of non existing virtual machines. Cucumber was the virtual machine serving Jenkins.io website years ago. It's been three, four years that that machine is long gone. So I decided to remove the mention to Cucumber Keys because it was used by Trusted CI to upload through AirSync the generated Jenkins IU website. That's not the case since four or five years. It appears that the same SSH key was also used by Trusted CI to connect to its permanent agent, Agent1. That's why the update center wasn't updated. So a new key has been inserted and the credential cleanup has been done. Um, Did you call it Concumber 2 or no? <laughs> that could have been a fun one. I, I, uh, next time I will promise I will call you. <laughs> um, some Jira components to be archived, uh, done. Nothing else, to, only administrator uh, can do that. Um, Alex Brandes, 
aka not my fault has been added as uh, to copy editor's team as validated on the mailing list. And also today, side, no side notes, I've added him to the Jenkins Infra organization group named Docker Images. So now is a maintainer of all the Docker Dash images that we build. The reason is uh, because he's helping us a lot on taking care of the dependencies and fixing the issues on most of these images. So that's why I decided he still cannot push or deploy himself. He only have the, the ability to open pull request and is considered trusted by Infra CI when it's scanning the repository. So his pull request will start safely. Also to the Docker team on Josh Jenkinson. So congrats, Alex, for that trust level. And thanks for the help. Um, we had issues uh, on the virtual machine with Docker on Windows, both 2019 and 22 that was uh, blocking all the test framework of the official Jenkins images. That issue is gone and fixed. That was a tricky one. I don't want to go into details. Everything is written within. Uh, and now we have up-to-date Docker, which is not Mirantis, but con community edition. And we have everything required for the, for the images. By the way, there is still a word issue. We, uh, there, we cannot update, we cannot create with PowerShell inside Windows container on our inbound uh, image. We cannot create, uh, there are some PowerShell commands that fail only on Windows server. That doesn't fail, so I cannot reproduce that on my machine. And that do not fail when run in interactive mode. <laughs> yeah. It's not in infrastructure things, but that's a funny one. Uh, monitoring improved data dog tagging for puppet virtual machines. That was a request from Stefan and Hervé that make a lot of sense. Instead of identifying infrastructure virtual machine per the host name, I mean, IP-172 dot something dot something is not really clear that it's trusted at CI, so better to use better human readable names. So it's done. Validated on Datadog, you can search. Uh, and uh, Apache logs combined with that make it easier for us to uh, when we have an operation or a failure in the infrastructure. Uh, there was a Jira account locked, uh, account issue that's fixed. As uh, part of the campaign of uh, cleaning up the AWS account to spend less credits, we finished uh, the garbage collecting. That was an old issue. So right now the garbage collecting is a bit aggressive because it deletes sometimes images of production. It's unexpected, it should not. But we were able to see, I need to comment on the later issue, but we saw the three of us that we were able to gain 60 bucks per month on the accounts, which, which is, yeah, 60 bucks per, uh, no, sorry, daily. That's better. Day. Yeah, so I would say it should be around 1.5K per month of economy. We already see that on the forecast. And the garbage collecting ensure that that's, that snapshot and AMI storage cost won't come back again. Um, I don't remember what issue was. I assume it was uh, closed. The documentation of the code signing renewal process for ourselves or our successors in three years has been done, validated and reviewed. So the whole GPG and side code signing should be okay. Um, good, thanks Maroc for catching the issue on update jenkinsci.org. So the certificate has been renewed. It's Weird because everything was in place, and in fact, we don't know why it failed. So we were able to renew everything. It looks like you are muted. So this was an this was expected to be an automated process, and the automated process did not happen as as hoped. Exactly. Um, oh, okay. From the system logs, we saw that the cron tab run the cron once a day at six in the morning UTC time, the, the root cron tab on all the virtual machine with uh, Let's Encrypt 
uh, run the crontab renew command. And that crontab renew should have detected the glitch. When we run manually the command, it succeeded in renewing the certificate. Hmm. That bot renew, not crontab renew. Oh yeah, sorry, third bot renew, my bad. So so this this was the SSL certificates. I thought, oh, okay, thanks. I had mis not read this well enough. I thought this was some other certificate used by Jenkins in communicating with or validating content. No, it's not. Oh, thank you. That's yeah, that's another issue. So we dig a bit, but it sounds like the the puppet uh, module and the way it's working is not correct. However, we saw there were some uh, leftovers of a former setbot package that were installing their own cron tab that was running at the same time. So there are users, I've uh, linked the issue, that had the issue and complained about that cron tab that shouldn't be managed if we don't use the native package. My guess is that the two cron tabs were competing because it I tried the cron tab with two user accounts and they were competing with a lock. The thing is, we cannot remove the dash Q flag. It's in row inside the puppet module on the cron tab. That's quite annoying. So my proposal is that we wait for the upcoming three months. We'll see if it happens. And if, if it happens again, as I wrote, then we will have to eventually disable the puppet feature and create the cron tab ourselves. So thanks, Mark. I think it will be worth it uh, to create the same kind of monitoring on Datadog in the future. We are still missing time for that, but yeah, thanks for monitoring this. And the Jira manipulation on the plugin. That's all for the task we for the task we did. Did I miss something else? Nope. Okay. So the work in progress. Uh, first area, that one is quick. We need to renew the update center certificate, the one you just spoke about, Mark. Uh, the deadline is end of May. So this year we are starting quite early. So thanks Stefan for taking care of that. Uh, Stefan handed me over and then I handed it to Olivier uh, because we need either KK, Oleg or Olivier Vernin to generate the certificate. I've to discussed. Sign it. sign it. Oh, yeah. M maybe they only have to sign, but they have a critical private key, yeah. which is a, a credential. Um, last year, Olivier and I decided not uh, to grant me that the access to this one because the cert, the um, the CRL behind and the, the certificate authority is valid until 2028. It's still five years from now, which means the more people have access to this, the more people could play around with the update center. So the goal is to try to have as less possible having access to that credential. Renewing that root certificate means updating all Jenkins instances. That was done in 2018, and that wasn't an easy moment. So better to have this once a decade. Um, so we have asked Olivier is was still bothered by the fact uh, we cannot have the key. So he's asking if I can have the key as well encrypted to my name that I will put on a, on a restricted, restricted machine. Uh, Mark, is it okay if we submit that proposal to the Jenkins board? Yes, I, I think so. I want this to be validated. I'm not sure if I should ask on a public email or if we if we start with the board and then extend, I'm not sure of what will be the, yeah, the best way. I'd, I'd say ask the board. I don't know that the board usually processes those kinds of requests, but it seems good to ask the board. Okay, so got to ask the board. Um, and I ask Olivier to send me a new certificate so we can renew it, but we have still some time. To generate certificate for us asking the board if Damien may have the CI key along with KK, Oleg and Olivier. 
So as soon as we have the certificate, uh, Stefan, uh, you can continue working on this. Thanks for checking the documentation. So like it's good. We were able to write it properly last year. That's also your job. So thanks. And yeah, let's see in uh, one or two weeks. I'm adding that one automatically to next milestone, if that's OK for you. That's perfect. Any question? Next, next object uh, I aggregated, we have two issues about the email sending issue. So we have currently two issues blocked by the fact that the users complained they'd never received the email with the password when creating their account on accounts Jenkins.io. Um, so on that topic, uh, we don't have access to the SendGrid uh, cloud account that is currently used by account Jenkins.io. So we cannot monitor if these emails were gray listed, if they were sending issue to the respective provider. So we asked KK and we got different answers. First, KK was able to grant us access to the a mail girl account, mail gun account where Andrew, Tyler already had access. So now the four of us have access. So please a reminder, can you use a personal account and enable M, uh, multiple authentication factor mail gun for everyone here? Um, mail gun doesn't seem to be used. Earlier today, KK also answered that the SunGrid account has a plan that only allows one administrator which is him. So he's asking if he should grant the access to someone else that could be technically doable. Um, and also Tim Yacomb and Olivier answered about this sending service email concern. So Tim uh, told us that maybe we could set up our own SendGrid instance uh, because it can be managed within Azure. Advantage is that the billing will be centralized and any Azure administrator or let's say account could be granted access to that send green instance inside Azure. That would be interesting in terms of con access control for admins. And Olivier warned us about the potential costs. As far as I can tell, SendGrid uh, is around 50 bucks per month. I don't know who is paying this. I assume it's KK, <laughs> but maybe not. <laughs> I never had an answer from KK on that particular topic. Uh, maybe it's not paid. Uh, I got a billing uh, spreadsheets from Olivier that mentioned 40 point, like 40 point 90, no, it's 14 or 15 bucks per month for SunGrid, but that's the only information I get. So my, uh, the proposal made uh, by, I think, Ervian Stefan was, can we change on account Jenkins IO the, send, the email sending provider? The real question behind this is the amount of email and the cost that we will have. Are we able to switch to Mailgun since we have access? Should we need to a bigger SunGrid instance that could cost us money? That's the question. Yeah, yeah. looking right now at the SunGrid offer on the portal, it's uh, around 20 bucks per month for 50,000 uh, email per month, so it should uh, be more than enough. On Azure? On Azure. Okay, so that could be, yeah. Yeah, for accounts Jenkins IO, that should be clearly okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, we, and, yeah. Yep. And About on mail gun area, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Right. Uh, the current send green account, the problem is there is a two FA on it, and uh, yeah, uh, it's a problem as one one number has to be dedicated to it. I was thinking maybe we could uh, get a Twilio account for that. I don't and know. we will get the two FA account for Twilio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think your proper, your the fact that you check the SunGrid uh, on Azure if it's twenty bucks per month. I mean, for that amount of email, that will make that's absolutely an option. It's not costly. Uh, my question is, I don't know the plan for Mailgun. Are you okay to check and compare because we have Mailgun accounts with multiple administrators already today? 
So yes. wh why not using it if it's if we are in the end of free plan? If not, yes. let's compare prices and use Azure instead. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, Megan, is a paid account or free account? I don't know. <laughs> can I ask you to? Olivier. Yeah. yeah, I can check. Uh, when I suggested we could use any free tier of any mail provider, as we don't send lots of email. He... Yep. You noted that uh, free accounts are on shared IP and this uh, with a big risk of blacklisting. Oh, let me so, take note of that. Uh, that's one of the main uh, preoccupation and concern for, for Mailgun. So even on shared uh, IPs, they are drastically hitting people with non-secure database. So I'm, I'm pretty confident on, on the the quality of those shared IP. Uh, from Mailgun, okay. For Mailgun, yes. Yeah, it was but... Mailjet before and they, they had very strict usage and they checked before sending. So uh, they are really good. So the question is, what if a large corporation that just sits on what will be the good rules for checking the CIM or email sending says suddenly that IP must be blocked? Then you are like uh, Damien Duportal trying to send an email to uh, the mail group of uh, Gmail <laughs> from his Gmail. And as an admin of the, of the group and is still sent in, in, in spam, of course, there is there is absolutely no way to prevent that. But even with a dedicated IP, and um, I, I I know how they 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 work on that area, and that's really hard. And they do a great job. That that's all I can say. Of course, okay. that's not foolproof. Okay, so the shared IP challenge, Hervé, and the pricing uh, looks like the these are the challenge to solve here. Is that okay for you? Yes. So if you see a solution, you can go both. As an infrastructure officer, I absolutely trust you on that part. If you have any doubt or want someone else to uh, help on the decision, don't hesitate to ask. Looks good? Okay. Using the Azure SunGrid will mean uh, eventually creating it manually and then importing it on Terraform is possible to have a configuration management if you go the Azure way. The cost of 20 bucks per month is acceptable uh, inside the, the Azure billing. And if you go the Mailgun account, then go ahead and update. The, the goal is to unblock the users and being able to have a runbook explaining. If you have an issue with email sending, go there or go there, and then we can we can help users. Is that okay for you? So unless someone has a question, I switch to Azure Cost. Okay, so we realized that uh, we were we could uh, decrease the Azure billing. Uh, we had two options. The first option on Azure Cost was using an artifact manager to ensure that CI Jenkins IO outbound bandwidth uh, could be decreased. So what has been done um, on the BOM builds? Uh, Jesse Glick was able to merge a, a proposal where most of the stash and stash steps during the build aren't done anymore. We were able, so I need to comment on the cl uh, cl uh, issue. We saw an impact. The outbound bandwidth decreased due to this change. The, uh, the forecast showed we were around 600 instead of 1,300 last month. Uh, could be worth checking the month before, though, because we had uh, quite an unusual activity uh, last week. But clearly, uh, BOM is one of the culprits. Uh, the Artifact Manager is a tentative to decrease that outbound bandwidth, because on Azure, the outbound bandwidth pay from Azure buckets is clearly lower than from a virtual machine. One of the main reasons is by default, the blob storage, when they are public, like the one we would have there to serve the archived artifact of CI Jenkins IO, 
it will use the Azure CDN by default. You can disable, but it's enabled. That's why Microsoft is able to decrease the cost because it's served through their CDN network. How does it work? Artifact Manager, once installed and configured, the archive artifact or stash and stash operation right from the, the CI Jenkins IO virtual machine to an Azure blob bucket. And then CI Jenkins IO, when you click on an artifact because you want to download it, for instance, all plugins archived dot HPI generated file, which is a few megabytes, then CI Jenkins IO redirects you to a temporary IP valid, uh, valid for one hour. So when you click, you have an HTTP redirect from CI Jenkins IO to their Azure content network. And CI Jenkins IO is not serving the data, only the redirect. And in background, each time someone issue a request to an artifact which is stored on blob storage then a new token is generated for each and these are a bunch of temporary token that's a really smart behavior so so even even requests from jenkins agents would be satisfied by the content delivery network not by i don't know for this one i assume it depends on where you are. If you are inside Azure, for instance, Azure Virtual Machine Agents, then the answer is no. But for the AWS or DigitalOcean, yes, I believe so. In any case, CDN or not, the goal is to have the, the these files served by another service than CI Jenkins IO itself less pressure on the Apache server, less storage, and less thread serving requests. So that's, that's a good idea. Problem is that after 22 hours, we started to have weird errors with nothing on the controller logs. And on the build logs, you had a TCP uncheck error when the build was trying to stash, unstash or archive an artifact. We saw data in the bucket. I initially thought that my initial configuration was wrong, but team, uh, thanks team checked that it was working. We were able to reproduce. And with a few builds that we tried, it worked every time from our local controller tests, which means there is an issue when scaling up with CI Jenkins IO and or an issue in CI Jenkins IO setup. So that's why we disabled this one. A team was able to pin some this error message to some behavior of the underlying Azure SDK that is used to connect to Azure API in Java through the Jenkins plugins. So an, ish, an update of that plugin fixing some of these issues, but not all have been issued and deployed to CI Jenkins IO. So the proposal is assuming a proper communication to developers that we will try again using the Azure Artifact Caching Manager. And the idea is uh, we will see and enable debug logging, at least for the administrator, to see if the same behavior happens again to help the plugin developer to, to pin the issue because it's expected to work and it should be transparent. Um, on that particular topic, I, I was a bit uh, dismayed about this not working. So I tried the S3, that's the same thing but with uh, for Amazon S3 buckets. But since we tried to get away uh, static services from Amazon accounts, I wanted to use another. I used a tray with DigitalOcean Space, which is fully compliant with S3. I'm not sure if I misunderstood the configuration of the plugin, but it looks like I wasn't able to make it work. So same, I opened issue and I got help from Jesse Glick. So uh, we I will need to retry that part. My, um, the question is how it behave if we have both systems installed and set up at the same time a given controller, because technically you can do that from the UI. I'm interested in knowing how it work. How does Jenkins select one or the other? I don't know, and it's written nowhere, and no one was able to give me a proper answer. So I propose let's try locally. Um, the question I want to raise is maybe in order to keep an equilibrium, if we cannot make the Azure plugin, I want to raise the question of we can still use an S3 bucket 
That means the artifact will be sent from Azure to Amazon each time. But most of these artifacts are in fact generated by AWS or DigitalOcean agents. So they will be copied from DigitalOcean and Amazon directly on S3. And CI Jenkins IO will only issue a redirect to AWS when someone requests the artifact. So that should still be able to allow us to decrease the bandwidth. That could be a solution. Most of our builds happen in AWS anyway. So that, that's the area where we are. So now the proposal is to start with Azure first time. Is that clear? Does it make sense? And does it trigger question or things or ideas? Okay, so the, the amount, the, the magnitude here of data and money we can avoid spending is a bit low, uh, is from 500 to 1000 bucks per month, just you have an order of magnitude. Um, on the other costs, uh, Stefan, can you uh, report what you did around the IRM64? Uh, yeah, I was, I was pretty happy because I managed to have uh, the build from Packer for the Azure IRM64. But uh, for now, it's uh, bumping into an error due to the um, not not being able to overwrite uh vm images and uh, uh, machine images within the azure gallery if you got the same version there is uh, it's forbidden to override the old one and um, that's a problem not for the production usage so when we when we uh, issue a tag it should be okay but when we do pr and and built on main we are using dev gallery and and staging gallery and those one uh we are in in a in a problem we we are stuck in that problem of uh, uh already uh, existing images so uh we were going away with uh, um locking uh, uh version and and using five only and uh, and then we realized that maybe it would be easier to add a, a time tag or, or an alias tag at the end of the uh, same ver version but we need to make sure that we got the garbage collector running smoothly on that because if not we will have tons of uh, images in those gallery so it's working but kind of useless for now the next step for us will be to be able to start using uh, infraci.jenkins.io to build our own Docker images on IRM64 or to switch to the all-in-one image and start most of, most of our workloads to IRM64. Um, on the Azure costs, spot instant, using spot instances, so spot instances, um, we checked um, the price is, alas, only two times better, which means if a spot instance is reclaimed, then only one retry remove all the, the benefits. And the non-benefit is developers seeing their build being retried, especially on the ATH. The thing is in the case of plugins, that builds on virtual machine requiring Docker. Most of these plugins needs Docker and have um, yeah, 30 to 60 minute builds. It's not a quick build of Maven clean install, you have an HPA. Most of the integration tests use Docker and need virtual machine and could be reclaimed by Spot. Same thing for, for ATH. Some ATH branches are just a few minutes and could be good customer of, of ATH of a spot instance, but some take six hours. So you don't want a six hour process to be canceled by a spot reclaim. So using spot for the ATH is not a good idea. And the proposal is we might need to propose new templates with spot, and then we could either opt in or opt out. But in the case of ATH, that will need a bit of revamp inside. It's not easy. 
it's not an easy way to gain money. So spot instance for virtual machines uh, in Azure might not be uh, interesting in our, for CI Jenkins IO agents. However, we enabled it for Packer VM builds that we do because uh, most of the spot reclaim is one hour and most of our builds anyway takes 40 to 15 minutes. So let's see how it behaves, but that's just a few bucks to gain here. Then unless you have questions about Azure costs, right now we should be just under the 10K this month with the current workload, meaning all the virtual machine of CI Jenkins IO are running on Azure. That's the current status. So we should be okay. And then we will need to decrease CI Jenkins IO spendings on Azure. That will be the next step. AWS costs, bomb build, bomb build, bomb build, and trusted CI. Stefan, yes, what's the status um, of trusted CI migration to Azure? For now, I'm defining the, the VM that uh, we need to spawn on uh, Azure for trusted within uh, um, Terraform. And I'm on the, on the network side right now. I, uh, so I have two PR uh, on two repository. Uh, because we have Azure and we have Azure Net. So right now I try to have both of them working together with um, creation with, of the network within Azure Net and usage of that uh, network in Azure. But um, yes, it's it's my main task. If the RM64 leave me alone for a while. <laughs> okay, yeah, because it, it, it took my brain way too much. That happen. Um, do you need a review or unblocking on that task on the upcoming days, um, or I will probably need to uh, to check with you uh, uh, if if I did correctly for the for the mind of of the of the net tomorrow. If you if you're um, available, okay, should should be doable. Thanks. Um, worked so we were able to successfully start and run partially a bomb build on a new uh, set of node pool. The assumption is uh, we are able to show that we can decrease the costs of the bomb builds. There are different layers. The layer here is first targeting of not blocking the plugin builds that need container when there is a, a bomb build or a storm of bomb builds. At least plugin developer will have a short of feedback loops. Second, see how we could decrease uh, the cost of a given bomb build by packing more agents on bigger machines. So the overhead costs less. And also bigger machines helps us to use, uh, let's say, low cost spot instances. So we have updated the existing um, node pool that BOM and plugins is using on AWS to decrease the cost of a single pod unitarily. That doesn't mean that we'll decrease the cost globally because it depends on other parameters, but still we were able to, to decrease of 20% the cost. And we also change the spot eviction rate because most of the instance state uh, size we were using had a 10, sometimes 15% eviction rate, which was visible on the bomb builds with a lot of agents. While now we are under 5% for every kind we use. And we added the new bomb builds and there is a lot of learnings on that area. Uh, we are in a loop back. The work that JC did to help us on the outbound bandwidth consists in instead of building one time the megawatt, stashing it and unstashing it 280 times, which is costly. Now we build it 280 times, but it's available locally. That one has an impact on the compute that surfaces some of issues we already had before especially CPU contention. It looks like four CPU per branch on the BOM is not enough. So um, we, have, we have different solutions here, but it seems like we need a self-made solution for 
stashing and unstashing here. That means we should ensure that everything is running on that uh, new uh, uh, node pool and that we should use either an EBS volume or a S3 bucket. So we build one time the war, we, we, we copy it here, and then we can reuse it. That's an optimization. The good and positive thing is now we have a way to measure specifically the behavior of bomb builds. So let's, uh, let's iterate on that part. Important takeaway for us as administrator, as underlined by Jesse, the BOM build currently use label. The label allocate an agent and we as admin implement the interface contract that the label is by saying, oh, it's a pod template. If the label is GDK 17, it's that, that template or this one or this one. The test we did, we directly specify the pod template method in the pipeline itself. So we don't use that label contract by the admin. The advantage of that new of that second method is that it surfaces the pod eviction to the developer in the build logs, which wasn't the case before. It was only on the controller logs, so hidden from developers. And the thing is with the spot instances high eviction rate and some OOM on some pods and also CPU eviction because using too much CPU due to the, we have a limit of four CPU. Sometimes we saw peaks in five and six requested. So the system killed the pod and then you have a reattempt. So we are working on still studying the metrics on this area, but what was surfaced by the last builds yesterday and this night is that there is an issue on CI Jenkins IO. We don't know if it's Jenkins, if it's the Kubernetes plugin, if it's our world setup, fits the topology Azure to AWS, but SH steps on the bomb builds, for instance, a single curl request that check for the ACP uh, availability that should take a few seconds. It takes two, three, four, sometimes five minutes for the controller to establish the connection to the agent, run the command and report back. So 10 minutes building the megawar three to 15 minutes for running all the intermediate steps, and then 15 to 20 minutes of running the PCT. That means each branches of the 280 branches is currently taking 30 to 45 minutes each at the same time. So of course, no improvement in the build time and in the costs, it's even worse. That's the status right now. So that's why we haven't merged or changed anything yet. Um, now on the minor issues. Oh no, so, we have still the artifact caching proxy reliable on that era. Yes, so, uh, Mark? Damien, if you're willing, so Hervé and I were just having a discussion prior to this meeting about bomb cost reductions. I'll be sending an email message proposing to significantly reduce bomb execution costs by changing what we execute when we execute it. So the idea I'm going to take is I'm going to propose that we will only run a very lightweight step on each pull request. And that in order to, in order to run bigger tests, the tests we currently run on every pull request, we'll have to apply either a label or a comment to a, a pull request. And what we'll what I'm proposing to do is we'll use an, an opt, octopus merge to combine many pull requests into a single build. So that we cut the costs, we get yep. the we get the smoke test that happens. It takes from five to twenty minutes to run the smoke test, and the smoke test tells us important things. But then the proposal will be: let's only run the bigger set of tests, the ones we run on every pull request now, when a developer specifically says, and a maintainer of that repository specifically says, "I want to run it," and they'll only do it when they believe it's valuable enough to justify the, the, the spend. Absolutely. That, that's absolutely a good way because it can be done now or later and it doesn't, um, it doesn't predate or create any kind of problems yeah. with the other optimization. Right, we they still, are independent. Yep. We, we still need to fix that issue. I mean, mm -hmm. 300 parallel elements in the build queue should not take minute for a Jenkins instance that size. There is something abnormal here. But right. still, yeah, that will, uh, that's a really good idea. 
if we are able to to drive this. Thanks, Hervé. Thanks, uh, Mark, for that idea. So now I did realize, just as I was describing it, there's an exception case there when a developer wants to evaluate a a prototype. They need to be able. To, they need to get full execution, like a regular pull yep. request. So I think what we would do is say, if the label has dependencies, only run the small test. Only run the smoke test. Yep, an opt-in with a we'll, specific we'll, label. Oh, yeah, right. We'll yep. we'll discuss that. In in the I'll use the developer list. I think for that discussion. Yes. Is that okay for also opening an issue on L desk to track the idea? That oh yes. If that yeah, if if that's okay with you, I'll do that. Uh, that's a better way to do it. That gives us a very solid place to, to track and discuss. Good, I'll yeah, do that. The, the discussion uh, in the mailing list is clearly uh, better, but yeah, putting a uh, track tracks record for audits uh, mm -hmm. to serve as support for us is important. Great. Co okay, correct, good idea. And that, that's absolutely worth it, folks. Um, hmm. Every, uh, so, uh, no, sorry. So that's all for the bomb. Uh, we had, we weren't able to reproduce ACP issues with artifact caching proxy on digital ocean. Only, only digital ocean for the bomb. I don't speak about ATH in Azure. That's another topic. Um, Hervé, uh, you had concern about that the recent changes from Jesse weren't absolutely using ACP everywhere. So my test on the bomb separation shows that. ACP is used for the megawatt generation. However, Mark, we are not sure, and we might need, uh, or at least we might need your help understanding each PCT, the PCT.sh step. Once you have the megawatt and you run the PCT, it's a jar file that is called with a few parameters in the shell script. And we don't know what that process is doing. Is it calling Maven and building things, or is it doing something else? Yeah, Meaning, I've... do we need ACP to be used for the PCT.jar calls? I'll have to. I'll have to look to be sure. I I confess I don't know. Um, is the that sh in need of uh, for the ATH issue that Basil reported? Uh, that's different topic. Mm. That's not the same job. And that's not the same network, that's not the same cloud, and that's not the same error message. In digital ocean, it sounds like that it's when we start having too much digital ocean uh, parallel uh, steps, then it's uh, it start. We might have a limit in the in the system. In the case of the ATH, that's TCP connection refuse. That's absolutely the network. So maybe that could be the Kubernetes cluster with the Azure ICP blocking connection at load balancer level because it reaches a certain amount. But I believe we are still using the old network for CI Jenkins IO and its virtual machine agents, which is overlapped with a bunch of issues. So the proposal on short term, uh, two proposals. First one, we don't need to focus on using uh, ACP for the ATH, at least not for the parts mentioned by Basil because it's partially used, unless we demonstrate the opposite using the, uh, the, the metrics from GFROG. Second is that in the CI Jenkins IO uh, performance tuning that we need to do as soon as possible, migrating the controller and the agent to subnets on, in the new public network built by Hervé will be a solution. CI.Jenkins IO network changes. Did I forget something about ACP or RV? No, it's good. It's good. Okay. Um, tiny tasks make environment and description fields mandatory for bug type issues. I propose to remove that issue from milestone. Alex opened it. Uh, that's worth a discussion with the Jenkins core. I don't feel like it's the Jenkins infrastructure team role. I don't say we close it because still we are Jira administrator and if a decision to change the behavior of this field on Jira is needed, we need an audit track and we need someone to act. Mm -hmm. We could post a link to the mailing list thread in the help desk issue. Oh, we don't, if done it, okay. Yeah. Yes, right. 
So yeah, so I propose to remove from milestone. No objection? No objection. A uh, tiny issue, Puppet Agents keeps updating the GPG key. Each time we have a weekly, there is something on the system that writes the value of the new key, the new key file has dash 2023 in its name, to the hold file, while Puppet on the PKG keeps updating it the other way around. So we are spammed by this one. We have to find which part of the weekly process. I was able to pinpoint to the mirror scripts two weeks ago, but it's not the only one doing that. So I misunderstood something or missed something. That's minor, it's just an annoyance for us. Um, ARM64 VM agent unavailable, same uh, garbage collection of the Packer MEI is uh, a bit too drastic. So the proposal here should be quick. Before deleting an MEI, let's check the configuration, the public configuration file from CI Jenkins and Infra CI. And if the MEI is within, don't delete it. So that one should be easy to implement. Um, CI Jenkins IO define a default build discarder. I've installed the plugin. I haven't looked yet. I will want to do a, a, a session with you folks because uh, in, so we need it. We need to decide and communicate, but also, uh, I don't know if you remember the two of you, when we checked the details of the um, child orphan policy on the organization scanning on CI Jenkins IO, which define how much element when a repository or a branch is deleted, how much element or how much time an element should be kept. And I discovered there is something named a build strategy that provide the build rotation logs that we were searching for, which is a bit different than the orphan child. So maybe we could we could have not only this at top level by default, but we could define one policy for each GitHub top level element in CI Jenkins IO. And we missed that one last time. So if it's okay for you, I will want to take 30 minutes because I remember Hervé last week before the DevOps you mentioned setting like this one that I warned you about not applying, not immediately, yeah, I and wanted, I propose we do this in group. I wanted to find a way to, for CI Jenkins IO to not build the archived repository. I don't know if there is something for that. There and should how, be. When they are taking, when the archive, archival is taken in account. Yes. Uh, so that's that's to be checked. Theoretically, they shouldn't be built with the configuration you, you we have. So there is something doing word, and we I wanted to share the knowledge on that session. So next step is uh, setting a default build discard the policy and communicate about that to developers saying, hey, now it's only five bits. Uh, just just a minute. I need to shut down to. Sorry. Um, Hervé, lo add launchable to agents? Were you? The, the, the issue before about uh, the dog, I haven't had time to okay. check it. Add launchable to agent. Uh, my pull request is ready. The sanity checks are OK. So when uh, it will be merged, I will be able to update uh, the pipeline library. To use the install the launchable or install it if not. Good. One last issue is Ubuntu 22 upgrade campaign. Um, I was only able to start a pull request on the Docker Open VPN image. I haven't checked the result yet. Air open to be checked and deployed. 
Uh, I think that's already a lot. There is an issue incoming for CID and Kinsayo with the following written elements. So summary, so we can close that meeting. Um, we need to change the system disk to an SSD on CID and Kinsayo. Uh, as you told us, survey importing on Terraform could be done uh, one shot. So we should be able to audit and check all the resource settings on the hardware, especially the SSD issue. Then we that should allow us to enable disk snapshots on the Jenkins home, so we could get rid of the job config history. There is the network migration that we mentioned earlier that could help also. Um, related to the Azure port, I've asked Tim Yacom if uh, we could shrink the amount of Azure virtual uh, uh, machine yeah. templates. And another one interesting to share with you, Hervé, because I think you were the first person to ask me about that. Um, I will want to also enable web sockets. So the agent will communicate to the controller through HTTP and web sockets, which is way better than the inbound TCP native for resource usage. Do you have anything else? No, I'm good. Okay, I'm stopping the recording. Stopping screen sharing first, stopping recording and see you next week.